A warm welcome from our directors and shareholders. My name is Dion Kelthorpe and I'm your virtual host today. We find ourselves in a perfect storm, compounded by the military action in Eastern Europe, the after effects of COVID and the changing weather patterns amongst a host of global challenges. We trust you'll walk away from this webinar more informed and prepared for the seismic changes across soft oils, allied and non-allied categories. We now call upon Ziad Khan to please open with a prayer. Greetings to one and all. In the name of the Almighty, the most beneficent and the most merciful, all praises are due to the Almighty. May the Almighty fill this world with peace, hope and joy during these trying times. O Almighty, we ask that you protect us from sicknesses, dreaded diseases, conflict in places such as Syria, Yemen, Ukraine, and the pandemic currently affecting us. O, Al o Almighty, grant cure to those who are sick and ease the economic hardship that has resulted from the pandemic. O Almighty, grant us all success and prosperity. Amen. Thank you, Ziad. Um, Thomas Milka uh, is our guest speaker today. Directly after Thomas has spoken, there will be a question and answer session. We urge you please to post your questions on the platform. And we humbly request that you refrain from posting geopolitical questions as that is not our field of expertise. Thomas is the Executive Director of Ista Milka and Hamburg, Germany, who are also the publishers of Oil World. Ista Milka is a leading research organization that provides global supply, demand, and price analysis, statistics, fork and forecasts for all major oil seeds, vegetable oils, animal fats, and oil meals as well as biodiesel and livestock products with clients in over 100 countries, including South Africa. Thomas has been on several of our webinars. He's a well-traveled speaker and speaks at conferences and workshops. He lectures at the local university in Hamburg. He's also a member of the program of the advisory committee of the Malaysian Palm Oil Board. Thank you for joining us, Thomas. The virtual platform is yours. So, uh, Dean, you can see my screen, my my slide. Yes, we can, Thomas. Okay, so let's let's get started. Uh, extremely difficult global market situation. We have had two consecutive La Nina periods and crop losses in South America. We had last year uh, weather caused damage in North America, primarily in Canada. And for the past three years, we had experienced production problems in palm oil. Very critical situation. Worldwide stocks are stocks of edible oils are at a low level and on top of that we are now facing uh, the war uh, in Ukraine and the disruption of export supplies from the Black Sea locations. Um, prices are going through the roof and I'm not sure whether we have seen the highs yet. But there are responses on the demand side. Many consumers all over the world cannot pay current prices. Consumption is declining. Uh, capita consumption is declining in many countries. Uh, we are moving into a recession most likely in the course of this year, and this is also bearish for demand and uh, will help to bring this market in an equilibrium. 
Now, before I go, before I go into details, let me briefly introduce my company, ESTA, International Statistical Agricultural Information. We are independent. We are not involved in trading. We provide unbiased information. There is no involvement from any party, either from the neither from the supply, not from the demand side into our company. Uh, so we are unbiased. We are independent. We provide monthly and quarterly and annual world supply and demand balances in our daily, weekly, and monthly reports. We want to be of assistance to our subscribers, helping them to better understand the global market. And uh, please feel free, everybody, please feel free to contact me for further information in the weeks uh, and months to come. Sunflower oil. Prices are exploding. Yesterday, the European price in sunflower oil skyrocketed to 3,000 US dollars. 3,000 US dollars. A doubling of the sunflower oil price within only three weeks. A severe tightness. Several consumers will be running out of sunflower oil supplies soon, particularly in Europe. Many of the consumers who have covered are now concerned that they will not get physical delivery because of uh, the shortfall in exports from the Black Sea region. In Europe, we normally satisfy 38 to 42 percent of our consumption with sunflower oil from Ukraine, which is not coming. Uh, about 1.2 million tons, about, about 1.2 million tons of sun oil was scheduled to be exported out of the Black Sea in March and again in April this year. This 1.2 million tons is not being exported, at least in March. And uh, of course, we don't know when a ceasefire can be reached. Uh, they are con negotiating at the moment. But even if they have reached a ceasefire, it will take time until the crushing plants, which are currently suspended, most of them in Ukraine, until this crushing plant starts working, logistics are in place to the ports and exports can be resumed. At the moment, Odessa is still looking good with, with, with hardly any damage. Um, this is not the case for the other ports, but uh, you know, it, it, we, we, we have to be seen how long will this disruption last? This week, today, Tomorrow, some ships which have been stuck at the ports at the Sea of Azov, which are Russian ports, some of the ships are now allowed to, to sail. Um, vegetable oils, wheat, and other food products are not included in the sanctions against Russia. So there is some hope that we will see some Russian uh, shipments some Russian shipments uh, in coming weeks, but it will take more time until Ukraine will resume shipments. So it's a very critical situation. Sunflower oil, which has been the tr price driver downward, or which was expected to be the price do driver downward for all the vegetable oils now in March, April, and May, has just become bullish. On top of that, there is concern about spring plantings in Ukraine. Um, it's very unlikely that we will get a normal uh, area, that we, get, that we will get normal plantings of sunflower seed, of corn, and of spring, spring wheat uh, in the current situation. Plantings normally start at the end of March, uh, accelerating in April. Uh, but with the current situation, we should not expect, we cannot expect 
that we will see a normal size of plantings. So there is the, there is the other concern that next season's crop will be affected, which will again have an impact on exports from Ukraine next season. So it's a very difficult situation and a lot of uncertainty. I cannot tell you whether we have seen the highs or whether we will move even higher before the market turns around. Now this was this was our estimate on world exports of sunflower oil just before Russia invaded Ukraine. We had expected that world exports will be rising by 2.4 million tons from a year ago in February, September, 4.3 million from Ukraine. So this is not going to happen. Unfortunately, the global market can replace only part of the sunflower oil which is not being shipped from the Black Sea in March and only part of the loss in April. This is the problem. We don't have enough palm oil supplies. We don't have enough soybean oil supplies. Um, and also rapeseed, is, rapeseed oil is tight. So worldwide, there is a problem. And this explains that the global situation is very tight and that prices are going through the roof to ration consumption. And this rationing of demand is taking place. Um, um, sunflower seed production worldwide uh, has recovered in the current season by 7 million tons to 58 million record crops in Ukraine and Russia. But slow farmer selling in the first half of the season kept crushings at a level below potential. Now we have a suspension of crushings in Ukraine and we also have a decline in crushings in Russia uh, and there is big uncertainty when production and exports will be resumed. Very important, the, um, very important, the um, um, missing sun oil volumes cannot be replaced cannot be replaced. There can be some demand shift from rapeseed oil uh, to rapeseed oil in Europe, but this will only be possible if rapeseed oil is not used by the biodiesel industry. And this is one of the issues we should discuss. To what extent can biodiesel consumption mandate be maintained in the current season? Um, what is going to happen? Uh, you know, uh, um, uh, are we going to see a new uh, discussion, food versus fuel? Uh, do we need more pressure from consumers worldwide onto the governments in the major biodiesel consuming countries to change the biodiesel admixture mandates to bring them down to allow more vegetable oil to be made available for the food industry. This is something we probably can discuss later. Rapeseed, rapeseed canola uh, is in a declining trend now for the past seven years. Um, reduced carry in stocks in the current season further complicated the situation. Worldwide, rapeseed oil, canola oil are tight. The Canadian crop was decimated by seven to eight million tons due to drought last summer. And we see this now in sharply reduced um, Canadian exports of rapeseed oil and meal. Small crops in Europe, in the US, and also in China. Um, there, is, there are two exceptions. One exception is Australia with a record crop of close to 7 million tons. And this is now resulting in large exports from Australia giving some relief. And secondly, the Indians are harvesting a record crop at the moment uh, and this will facilitate larger crushings in the Indian market. But this does not help 
to change the overall tight situation. So prices uh, have increased very sharply already in calendar year 2021. Now, and this is percentage changes. Um, the average for 2021 as compared to the calendar year 2020, a, more than 80% increase in palm kernel oil. Indonesian uh, crude palm oil up 72%. Big increases in soybean oil, rapeseed oil, sun oil, and coconut oil. Um, relatively moderate increases in the oil meals um, and oil seeds in between. But over the past three months, prices continue to accelerate. Now, at the beginning of March, uh, palm oil prices in Indonesia and in Malaysia approached $2,000, $2,000. Three times the long range average. Um, similar price increases in other vegetable oils. Stocks are unusually low, while biodiesel mandates in most countries at the moment are not yet reduced. And this is a situation which is difficult to understand for edible oil consumers who are suffering greatly from the high prices. In several African countries, in Asia, many other countries. Now, if, we're, if I look at the latest price changes, um, we see, and I compare the beginning of March this year as compared to March one year and two years ago, it's very clear that uh, prices are exploding for virtually every vegetable oil. Dramatic situation. Uh, also, crude mineral oil prices have increased to new multi-year highs, but the premium of vegetable oils, the premium of vegetable oil prices over fossil fuels have widened further. Still, consumption of vegetable oils for energy is rising. Biodiesel production increased last year to 48 million tons, and a further increase occurred so far this year. At the moment, 18% of um, world consumption of 17 oils and fats are used for biofuel against 12% 10 years ago. Will a new food versus fuel demand lead to reduced biofuel targets? From my point of view, I hope it does. I hope that the wasting of edible oils for biofuel is at least temporarily reduced or stopped. Uh, crude mineral oil prices going through the roof. Brent approached or even exceeded 130 US dollars per barrel. Um, um, energy prices rising sharply. Fertilizer prices rising sharply. Production costs in total rising sharply. We are moving into a period of higher inflation rates, not only food price inflation, but also uh, general inflation. And this inflation um, is uh, likely to be accompanied by a slowing down of growth in many countries, which in the medium term should have a bearish impact on vegetable oil prices. But at the moment, the market is hot, the uncertainty is big, and um, there we have probably have not seen the highs yet. Now let's let's look let's make a few words on palm oil. Sunflower oil prices would not be at the current high levels if we had a better supply situation in palm oil. Palm oil stocks are tight. We have seen 
significant production losses over the past two seasons, declining yields in Malaysia and Indonesia, lack of new plantings, a slowing down of replantings, uh, a slowing down of the growth in the mature area, a shortage of workers creating partly significant harvest losses and management issues, partly uh, lack of fertilizer applications. These all together resulted in a considerable uh, decline in a considerable uh, decline in palm oil yields and production. And this slide, I think, is very interesting here. It shows uh, the average annual yields in, Mal in Malaysia and Indonesia. Malaysian palm oil yields per hectare declined to a 20-year low in 2021. A declining trend also in Indonesia. Now, what does this mean? Depending how you calculate this, I would say approximately 10 million tons of palm oil has been lost over the past three years, cumulative, in Malaysia and Indonesia. A loss of 10 million tons of palm oil. This is one of the key reasons for the problems we have at the moment. It occurred initially unnoticed, but recently it became more and more obvious that palm oil has lost its growth dynamics. And as a result of this, palm oil stocks are tight. As a result of this, palm oil has turned into a premium oil relative to soybean oil and other oils because of lack of supplies. Now, to replace 10 million tons of palm oil, you have to crush 55 million tons of soybeans to get the same quantity of soybean oil. Of course, this quantity is not available in soybeans in addition to what we crush at the moment. Yeah, so the, 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 the loss of gross dynamics in palm oil, not because of weather, but because of other man-made problems, is one of the reasons for the global supply tightness we have at the moment, and one of the reasons for the high prices uh, we have. But as the global market experienced this loss, potential loss in palm oil production, the biodiesel mandates remained unchanged or even increased. Indonesia is still applying an admixture mandate of biodiesel of 30%. The European Union is still consuming 14 to 15 million tons of biodiesel every year, and the U.S. is talking about uh, ambitious biofuel, biodiesel uh, targets for the next few years. And therefore, we get the problem. We get a squeeze for edible oil supplies, and we now see the major effect of this because of the war at the Black Sea, interruption of supplies in the Black Sea, and the damage we have seen in South America over the past two months because of drought. Many importing countries have started to reduce imports and consumption. India is taking less vegetable oil. China is reducing, sharply reducing imports of vegetable oils because of the high prices and consumption is being adjusted downward. And many other countries, Bangladesh, several African countries, uh, the Near East, Iran, uh, Turkey, several other countries are reducing consumption uh, in response 
to the high prices. Palm oil is, palm oil is still the, the most important oil in the world and accounted for or contributed 50 million tons of world exports, but its share is declining. Soybean oil is still relatively small with a world export volume of 14 million tons, but it's rising. Our estimates for the current season, we point to, uh, we, we, we expect a recovery of 2.7 million tons in the current season, which is again below average, but follows two disappointing years. So overall, the performance of palm oil production in the key producing countries is still relatively poor. Um, Indonesia, we, we expect an increase by 1.3 million tons in the current season. We started low. October, December was down from a year ago. Um, recovering now a little bit, and uh, we should see a good recovery in the course of this year. Malaysia, up about 0.8 million tons. Not much. Still a low production, 18.8, 18.9 million tons this calendar year other countries rising by 600,000 tons. Uh, labor shortage um, will hopefully improve in Malaysia. Uh, if not, then we have to adjust our production estimate downward because lack of labor leads to production losses in the plantations. But overall, despite the improvement in production, um, supplies stay uh, tight and uh, importing countries have difficulties and cover their requirements. And I want to add latest developments in Indonesia. This morning, the Indonesian government announced that uh, the domestic sales obligation, the domestic sales obligation for the palm oil exporters has been raised with immediate effect, so it's starting tomorrow, has been raised from 20% to 30%, which means that every exporter of palm oil in Indonesia has to uh, first sell 30% of its targeted export volume to the domestic market before he gets authorization for his exports. The net effect is that uh, there will be another slowing down of the Indonesian exports in the months of March, simply because of bureaucratic reasons. Um, and this is, of course, bullish for the prices. Today, um, palm oil prices moved up steeply by 600 ringgits on the Bursa Malaysia derivatives in response to the decision of the Indonesian government. At the same time, the government continues its 30% biodiesel mandate. Indonesia is not only the biggest producer, it's also, also by far the biggest consumer, and uh, 8 million tons of the palm oil is being used for biodiesel. That's a lot. So the Indonesian policies of curbing, of monitoring exports, are adding to the tightness in the world. Malaysia cannot compensate this because Malaysian stocks are low. As this is occurring, and as the, <coughs> I'm sorry, as the Indonesian government is, is reducing exports, stocks are increasing. And at the moment, Indonesia is the country with the highest stocks of palm oil in the world, but these stocks cannot move out into the marketplace, into the global marketplace because of government policies. Further complicating the issue. Yeah. So the tightness in palm contributes to the record high prices of sunflower oil. Now what's what's the outlook for soya oil? In December, we at Oil World, we had expected prices to decline 
uh, in early 2022. Then came severe drought in many parts of South America. At the moment, we assume that we have lost 29 million tons of soybeans in South America due to drought in only 10 weeks. Soybean futures are consequently rallying. We have seen contract highs lately close to US dollar 17 per bushel. The situation is similar to 2012. Speculators fund buying, heavy fund buying are fueling the rally. Global supplies in soybeans are tight. Lower soybean imports and lower than expected crushings of soybeans in China are somewhat moderating the bullishness. But the situation in soybeans is bullish. Um, we currently estimate that South American soybean production will decline by at least 21 million tons against initial expectations of an increase of 8 to 9 million tons. My current estimates, Brazil 125.5. Yesterday, you may have seen CONAP. Uh, CONAP came out with a number. I think the number of CONAP was 122.9. Uh, so CONAP has further reduced its estimate. Our estimate is higher because we are working with a higher planted area. Um, some of the some of the uh, sowings, some of the soybean area, part of the soybean area is not accounted for by official statistics for obvious reasons. So there are big discrepancies in the production estimates. Even if our estimate is correct, 125.5, it's still down sharply from 139 million tons last year. Our long-term forecast for the year 2030 uh, is bearish. We, we expect that uh, Brazil in particular will continue to, to boost um, soybean production. Brazil, the big elephant in the room with, with considerable growth potential for the year 2030, we expect the Brazilian soybean crop to be around 200 million tons, 200 million tons. But nearby at the moment, um, Argentine crop between 40 and 41 million tons uh, affected by drought for the first crop at least. Now, uh, some very beneficial rains have occurred in central Argentina lately also in northern Argentina, which is helping later planted soybeans. Uh, the rains also in parts of Brazil, latest rains are helping the safrinha corn crop. Overall, um, we uh, expect a global production deficit in soybeans in the vicinity of 18 million tons. Stocks worldwide will be reduced by 18 million tons to a seven-year low. It's a, it's a bullish situation. A global demand will be shifting more and more to US origin, particularly for the second half of this year. Um, stocks will be reduced in South America and in the US. There will be the need for good weather and increased plantings in the Northern Hemisphere this spring and summer. So your oil futures rising. Uh, and yesterday, we made a new contract high on the uh, Chicago Board of Trade, close to 76 cent in the May contract for soybean oil. Um, there are reactions to the high prices, and I already mentioned this partly. Consumers are cutting back usage, mainly in the edible sector. Food consumers, primarily in developing countries, are reducing consumption. Secondly, producers are expanding. Farmers are boosting plantings. Uh, they did this last year, and uh, wherever possible, uh, we should see a further increase in plantings this year. It remains to be seen whether set aside area or conserve area from the conservation reserve 
uh, will be brought into, product, into production again this year due to the uh, very uh, special global situation. Uh, world production of 10 oil seeds still is declining uh, in the current season and uh, stocks will have to be reduced. For soybeans, we expect world production to drop by 14 million tons to 350 million, accounting for 60% of all oil seeds. Uh, all the other oil seeds under the lead of sunflower seed and uh, cotton seed are seen rising uh, by a combined 10 million tons. So concluding remarks, edible oil Edible oils are much stronger than oil meals, have been much stronger than oil meals during the past 12 months. At the moment, the tightness is more severe in edible oils. This could change, however, uh, from May or June onward, uh, depending on the availability of soybeans and the, and the crushings of soybeans in South America. There is considerable supply uncertainty, particularly in edible oils. And this explains that edible oil prices have skyrocketed over the past three weeks. I mentioned already that sunflower oil prices in Europe doubled during the past three weeks. But we have also seen steep increases to new highs in palm oil and soybean oil. At the moment, the vegetable oil export shortfall at the Black Sea represents about 13 to 14 percent of world exports. This is large. And this large quantity cannot be replaced by other origins at the moment. At the moment. How long will the war last? A big question mark. Nobody knows. How, uh, and, and the longer it lasts, the, the later we will see a recovery in exports of vegetable oils from the Black Sea. What will be the damage to infrastructure? We don't know. And, and this adds to the uncertainty in our market, and this partly adds to panic buying and, and makes things worse. Uh, and, and boosts prices to higher than justified levels. There's also the uncertainty how much of the spring sowings of grains and oil seeds can be accomplished in Ukraine in coming weeks. And we have to live with this uncertainty, unfortunately. But this, at the moment, at the moment still has a bullish impact on prices. One may argue that uh, the, the risks and the uncertainties are to a large extent already discounted in current prices. This could be the case, but probably not. Probably things get worse before they improve. I don't know. What is important to understand, particularly for policymakers, there has been more and more interference by governments in our markets. The global market cannot replace the loss of Black Sea vegetable oil exports of 1.2 to 1.3 million tons per month without sizably reducing oils and fats consumption in the energy sector. But will we see this? Will we see immediate political decisions to temporarily reduce the mandate uh, in Europe, in Indonesia, in the US? There have been some indications that the US administration is thinking on these lines, um, partly because of concern about food inflation. Um, but we are still waiting for the results of this. 
an announcement of a temporary reduction of biodiesel admixture mandate in any of the major regions would have an immediate bearish impact on prices. And this is a risk for the consumer. It could be that finally there will be this kind of announcements and this would then uh, bring down prices immediately. But if that does not happen, the necessary demand rationing must be placed on the shoulders of edible oil consumers. And uh, it's not sure whether the current price level is high enough to accomplish this. One factor to watch are the Russian exports. Um, uh, yes, we know that vegetable oil, uh, wheat and other food items are excluded from the sanctions and they are excluded from the financial constraints, uh, exclusion of swift payments of some of the Russian banks, they are excluded. So it remains to be seen to what extent will uh, shipments of vegetable oils and wheat and other commodities will be resumed from Russian ports in coming weeks uh, to somewhat uh, moderate the tightness. This is uncertain. So finally, and this is my last slide, ladies and gentlemen, stocks are very, uh, supplies are very tight worldwide. Prices are well supported in the nearby. Um, there has been a lot of uh, speculative buying, a lot of fund buying. So to some extent, there is the risk of a technical setback in the futures markets, which could spill over in the cash markets. This is always the case. Um, in the deferred positions, uh, we are already seeing uh, reduced prices. Uh, August, uh, October for rapeseed oil due to new crop arrivals. Uh, have, uh, are down from the nearby, down sharply from the nearby value. Palm olein, Malaysian palm olein, FOP Malaysia is currently quoted at close to $1,500 for July, September, uh, down sharply from $1,850 um, uh, for April. And these are the prices at the beginning of March, uh, March 3, last week. Um, and we also see soybean oil, October, December, soybean oil prices at 1510. Sun oil at the Black Sea is for understandable reasons unquoted. But also for sun oil, we should expect considerably lower prices in the second half of this year. I share this view and I, and I think uh, I, I share this view that prices in the deferred positions should be considerably lower than in the nearby. But downward pressure will be limited as long as the world has not replenished stocks to more comfortable levels. And finally, let me repeat again what I consider to be very important, a new food versus fuel debate is on the agenda. And it has to be done. Reductions, in my opinion, reductions of the biofuel targets have to be made in the current critical situation uh, uh, to help uh, and to, to, to moderate the tightness to the benefit of edible oil consumers. With this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I complete my presentation and I would be happy uh, to uh, discuss any further issues with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, we now call upon our business development executive, Ahmed Maitha, who will be the ringmaster and will attempt to get through all the questions within the next 20 to 25 minutes. Thank you, Ahmed. Thanks, Dion, and uh, thanks, Thomas, for a very insightful, if very somber presentation today. You can imagine that in the context of the war 
and other extraneous factors, there's been a flood of questions. I'm going to try to get through them as quickly as possible. So let's shoot. And uh, Thomas, I'm going to be sending you a bigger crystal ball for Christmas this year. Uh, the, <laughs> the first question comes from uh, Victor Lofty Eaton, an executive at the largest food retailer in the country, ShopRite. Victor asks very acutely, has there been any reports of seed crushing plants in Ukraine or the Black Sea region that have been damaged or totally destroyed because of the current conflict? Um, I have not heard of any, uh, but this does not mean anything. Uh, I know that uh, crushing has been suspended by all the big companies, uh, but uh, I have not heard anything about damage. Okay, good. Um, Thomas, the next question comes from a journalist, uh, very pointed about South Africa and other countries that are net importers of edible oils. Should, in the context of this war and the acute prices and the pressure on affordability, governments be doing more to drop tariffs in the short term to make these imports more affordable for the consumer on the ground? Uh, I think uh, uh, I think yes, they should. Um, at the moment. In many countries, there seems to be the opposite direction, that those countries who do have export supplies in wheat or in sunflower, think about building up export barriers to keep sufficient supplies to the domestic market. So we probably see both. Uh, um, uh, and and I hope this is not going to to spread that those who have supplies build up barriers to keep the supplies at home. Okay. Uh, and Tando asks, uh, what is South Africa's reliance on Ukraine and Russia for sun oil, or Southern Africa as a region rather, and how much do we import on an annual basis, on a net basis? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, that's a good question. I, um, uh, the, the totals I can tell you. Um, wait a minute. Um, I have my secret book here. I hope there's some secrets in there that you'll share with us from the crystal yeah, ball yeah. and that book. You know, I have, I have my yearbook here. Uh, yeah, so. where I have where I have every country in the world so so let me let me share this with you um, Republic of South Africa Nigeria Senegal South Africa now um, South Africa imported over the past uh, five years um, Hundred and fifty to two hundred and fifty thousand tons of sunflower oil per annum um, uh, from Ukraine. Very little. Uh, in in some years, um, fifty to sixty thousand tons from Argentina. The biggest supplier was Bulgaria. In 2019, 2020, was 115, 120,000 tons. Romania, Spain, Portugal. Um, uh, you know, very often it's European countries because of tax reasons where you import your sunflower oil from. Um, very little from Ukraine. But actually, this market is so flexible that um, even if you are not dependent on Ukraine supplies, you will be indirectly affected immediately by the shortage of Ukrainian Ukrainian exports because because European prices prices in Romania, Bulgaria, Spain, Italy go through the roof. Argentine prices go through the roof uh, because everybody is now jumping on Argentina, and uh, and uh, yeah. yeah, it's uh, also I mean European countries even if we were importing from them. They are in a bit of a panic mode now where they're banning a lot of exports, right, for their own food security. 
So, and like you no, said, we would not, we would not, we would not, no, no, we would not ban exports. I, I hope we would not be so foolish to ban exports. But uh, the adjustment comes by a price. Um, in the the European consumption is very inflexible. We have right. labeling, we have labeling uh, requirements. And if the label says sunflower oil, you have to put, you have to put sunflower oil in. Uh, yeah. Um, previously, it was vegetable oils. Now, nowadays, it's sunflower oil. So it must be 100% sunflower oil. We don't have this. We don't have it. And we are running out of sunflower oil uh, within three to four weeks if the war uh, stretches on for another uh, two, three, four weeks. Yeah. Um, so, so there is the risk that we are running out of sunflower, and this is the reason why the sunflower oil price is at three thousand dollars. This price jump in Europe makes sure that the rationing happens in India, in China, in Iran, in North Africa. These countries, uh, these countries will switch. Now you in South Africa, you you made just the right thing. You expanded sunflower plantings, and um, and if, if you are lucky, you are you you are you are harvesting a bumper crop now. Um, uh, latest not estimates quite, are very very not, promising, but but, but it's, not quite soon, right? That's uh, well. Uh, when is when is your harvest? Your harvest is in April, right? April May, yeah. So yeah. you know we're still in March. So, so, we so, so I know. think yeah. I think I think you have new supplies. You can you can re, you can reduce your stocks to minimum levels and then rely on domestic supplies. In other parts of the world, the next crop comes in August, September, uh, and uh, and 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 then, you know, be, be, before we get too bullish here, let let me also say, um, the war. Uh, and the lack of crushings in Ukraine and Russia at the moment will end up with unusually high stocks of sunflower seed by July and August. So the, so, so the seed, which is not crushed at the moment, will be crushed later. Uh, yeah. So it's not all that bullish. We, we have headaches at the moment. But the seed is still there and is waiting to be crushed. And part of the anticipated setback in Ukrainian sunflower seed production this year because of lower plantings can be compensated by unusually large stocks of sunflower seed carried over into the next season. Okay. So hypothetically, and hopefully we're all praying, the war ends, let's say, next week and sanity prevails, right? When will prices regularized, supply prices regularized. Are we going to see in this calendar year back to $900 a ton at those levels or is that pie in the sky? That is uh, very unlikely. Um, uh, if if a, a ceasefire uh, can be reached within the next two weeks uh, on which people rely, then it may take another three to four weeks until exports can be resumed. But this would be such a positive uh, news that uh, sunflower oil prices will react immediately. Bearish. It's going to be yeah. bearish, but, but from the current level. So sunflower oil prices can go back to 2,000 or 1,800 or 1,700. But uh, don't forget that all the other oils are on tight supply. Palm oil is tight. Palm oil is, is even at a premium to soybean oil. Soybean oil is tight. Uh, so, um, so no, we will have, to, we will have to, to wait for a longer period. We will continue to have above average prices for the second half of this year. However, however, war and inflation always means recession. Recession means lower demand. And lower demand w will ultimately help the global market to find a, an equilibrium at a lower price level. It's working. 
It's working already now. Um, demand rationing is ongoing. We are seeing considerable demand rationing now in China and in India and in Bangladesh and in some African countries, in Iran, in several countries. Um, even, even in Brazil, we see this now. Yeah. Um, so it's working. But uh, no, I think 900 is very unlikely. We are not going to see this in the course of this year unless we get a real game changer for biofuels. This is always on the agenda. And, and there are people who are questioning the whole concept of bio, biofuels, um, arguing that they are not uh, positive for the environment, but on the contrary, negative for the environment. So, so this discussion is still under, out, out, outstanding. If the biodiesel sector would, would, would be thrown off the table because of this crisis we have, this would have a momentum change in the global supply fundamentals, considering that we are currently using for, producing 48 to 49 million tons of biodiesel. I don't expect this to happen. I don't expect yes. this. Yeah. Um, but but if it happens, if it happens, it would be bearish. Yeah, I've got a question on that, Thomas. Just quickly, um, from Rezan Kassim, who says that. Shouldn't there be like treaties at government level? But I mean, I have a sense that it's, it's a bigger play there where consumers would have to pressure governments, right? Rather than the government taking the steps themselves to get to a treaty level to, you know, reduce the bio biodiesel mandates in the interest of food security and affordability. Correct. It should be the consumers and, and uh, I don't see them. I don't see yeah. the consumers. I don't see them. And of course, it's also our... Our, our job to, to educate politicians or to, to explain the global market fundamentals to politicians behind closed doors. This is nothing which, which, which we do in public. Um, you know, uh, so it, it's also part of our job. But, but most importantly, consumers going into the streets, getting organized and protesting against the wasting of food uh, for energy, which is ridiculous, which is really ridiculous in a situation in which prices are more than double the average price level. We, we are in a crisis and in the biodiesel sector nothing is happening and this does not make sense. And nothing is happening because politicians don't understand their responsibility. Many politicians still think, well, Thomas, we have enough supplies on the world market, don't we? And the answer is no, we have not. Yeah. So, yeah. so it is a very, this is a very crucial thing. Um, starvation, malnutrition is expanding, is rising now and in the coming weeks and months. And there is no adjustment on the bio, biofuel side. And this doesn't make sense. Yeah. Thomas, I want to talk a little bit about South Africa production in terms of our own food security and then Africa uh, across the, all the veg oils. Uh, like, for example, uh, Saya Pierce Jones is a journalist at uh, Eyewitness News and has posed a question about alternative oils like olive oil, canola. Uh, there's a question about palm oil from Africa production, whether for now that could supplement South Africa's requirements and even on an export level. South Africa could feed other parts of the world within reason uh, to uh, supplement the shortages or the impact that sunflower is having from the war in the Black Sea region. Yes, um, yes and no. Um, uh, changes uh, on the production side um, um, normally have, have a, a, a time lag. Uh, if you encourage palm oil production and if you start planting palm trees, uh, it, it will it will last uh, three to four years until you can uh, until you have the first harvest from this tree you are planting. But before you plant, you have to buy the land, you have to cultivate the land. So the, you you have to have a long long uh, breath, uh, you know, long vision. Um, palm oil is a long term engagement uh, where uh, you know you you have to have a long term vision. Uh, rapeseed 
uh, corn, sunflower, soybeans is a different a different problem. Uh, you you plant, and six months later or five months later you can harvest. Um, yes, and uh, to that extent, the current high prices give a, a a a incentive to producers to plant whatever they can if they have the machinery, if they have the knowledge, if they get the seed varieties. There is uh, one issue, and this is production cost. Fertilizer costs are record. Um, you you probably not even are able to get the fertilizer you want. There is also supply constraint. Um, production costs have increased sharply, but still, the market prices are offering uh, good incentives for producers, and this also refers to the African continent with the higher prices. Um, uh, African producers can make up for their lower yields they are obtaining, and they can compete in the world market. So probably we see we see this kind of of shift uh, in several African countries, uh, and we we there are good examples. South Africa is one example. Ethiopia, Tanzania are other examples where good or Ivory Coast where good expansion has taken place lately. Okay. Since we have quite a few journalists on the uh, webinar today. Suren Naidu from MoneyWeb has posted two questions. The first one, uh, Thomas, would be unfair to ask you to comment on specific retail prices in the South African market because you're not a specialist there. But um, generally, uh, the sunflower spike right now in other products uh, in food, edible uh, oil content products such as mayonnaise, margarines and stuff, do you see a direct correlation in spiking of prices in those products as well? This is this is for me difficult to to respond to uh, because I don't have the detailed information. Right. Um, uh, my 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 assumption would be that yes, it will be felt um, to a certain extent, um, but about the time lags and the extent, I don't know. Okay. Uh, next, very pertinent, quite a few attendees have posed about the demand drop in sunflower, the increase in soya. Uh, I think on the last webinar, you mentioned about South American farmers stockpiling because they had political issues. Is that still yeah. a case? Will soya replace sunflower in the short term? Will the soya prices push the pressures down? What about the security of soya out of Argentina right now? Yes, um, very good point. Um, sunfl uh, soya will replace uh, sunflower in countries like India or China, uh, Iran, uh, I think also in Egypt, um, not in Europe. Europe uh, has uh, certain issues um, which are difficult to understand. They uh, they 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 are resistant against uh, soybean oil made from GM soybeans, um, uh, which uh, scientifically is difficult to to justify. Um, but uh, yeah, in in most countries, uh, soybean oil can replace some of the loss in sunflower, but only some. Uh, as I said. Uh, 13 to 14 percent of world exports is currently lost in, in the current month. And this cannot be offset neither by soybean oil nor by palm oil. So we end up, we end up this month that we, that the world is consuming more than it's producing. Uh, so we have to cut our stocks and we have to reduce our consumption. And this is what's happening and this is what is enforced via the price. This is the reason why prices are so high, and this is also the reason why we probably have not seen the peaks. We may see higher prices if the war continues for another three or four weeks, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Uh, palm oil. We've touched on soya, palm oil, um, we know the issues of harvesting migrant labor in uh, Malaysia and Indonesia, so the shortage is there. Africa, could Africa supplement our consumption or are we going to be reliant on Malaysia and Indonesia for a long while to come? Uh, the, uh, 
the resources are there. Um, management, discipline, know-how. Uh, if that is all put together, yes, you could have a successful long-term improvement. Um, so far, what we have seen in the past 10, 15 years um, did not fully come up to expectations. But um, as I said, the growth dynamics in Palm, in Malaysia in particular, but also in Indonesia, have been lost. And this creates opportunities, new opportunities for other palm oil producers, for example, in Africa, or for sunflower or rapeseed producers in Africa, Europe, or South America uh, to compensate the loss in palm oil. And this will be, this will have to be accomplished by sufficiently attractive prices on the world market to stimulate investment into expanding production. Malaysia, uh, Malaysia in particular, cannot increase palm oil production mainly because of lack of lack of land. Yeah, and insufficient yields. So the expansion has to come from other parts in the world, and there is a possibility for African producers to get some of this cake. Discipline, management, know-how, it's all available. If it is put in place, yes, you can do this. So, Thomas, the fine line between panic and concern right now. With the shortages, the price spikes, we really don't know the war, when it's going to end. Uh, where should we be overall as bulk customers, retail customers, suppliers? So the question is, uh, are, are we are we getting are we getting uh, are we are we panicking too much? Is that the point? Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't think that there's panic here yet. I mean, you know, the, the supply, but you know, prices have gone up, and that's reality right now. But the longer the war goes on, would there be a need to panic? Or, I mean, knowing that South Africa, for example, we're going to have our own crop in about two to three months' time, right? No, we are panicking. And how panic can, Panic, panic is always a bad advisor. Yeah. And if you can avoid this, you are in a better situation. Uh, if you panic, you don't think. Uh, try to think and try to look at the options. And uh, um, uh, some consumers are currently panicking in certain countries where they buy more than they should because they don't know whether they get enough tomorrow. This kind of attitude is making the problem worse. Uh, if you can prevent panic, you are in a better situation. Uh, I don't think there is the need for panic. So no, no panic, but it is still concerning. And, and like you said in your intro, you, you believe we haven't seen the top of these bullish prices yet, right? I No, no, uh, no. I said I don't know whether we have seen the top. Um, uh, how can I? I think nobody can. Um, we can hope that... Uh, the Ukraine, Russian-Ukraine problem will be solved soon, just if we look at the civilian population. And uh, you, I think everybody knows and everybody has heard that more than 2 million people have moved out of uh, Ukraine into the European Union over the past three weeks. So this is huge. This is a huge movement of people. Uh, so we can only hope. And then um, we need, we just need 
two years of relatively good weather in the world. We, the, 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 the big producing countries were not blessed by good weather over the past two years. We have had several accidents, several extremes. I don't subscribe to the theory that these, subscream, that, that these subscream, uh, sub, uh, extremes are the new norm. I don't think so. If we have two years in a row of relatively good weather, we will all be fine. But what would be the worst if North America is running into, a, into weather problems in the next three months? This would be disaster because uh, we need normal yields and normal crops of oil seeds and grains in the US and in Canada in August and September this year. Then it's okay. If we don't get this, yes, we have a problem. You're such a bundle of joy today, Thomas. I say that in jest. Uh, Thomas, uh, we're coming up to our time limit. Uh, if you want to leave us with a parting shot, please, a summary of the total discussion today and your presentation for all the attendees. Uh, could you say this again? Uh, you, you, yes. you, you want me to make a summary? No, no, just a, just a parting comment from you, because we are coming up to our time limit for the webinar, and we will need to wrap up soon. Uh, um, well. Um, uh, my my last comment. Yes, uh, I'm I'm optimistic. I'm 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 optimistic that this situation will be will be resolved. That the very critical supply situation will be resolved by reactions of market participants on the supply side and on the demand side, um, so that we will have a better balance. Uh, of uh, world supply and demand, probably in the not too distant future. Thank you, Thomas. And on that point, I will hand over back to Dion Kelto. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Uh, thank you, Thomas. I now call upon the Williton Group uh, B2B Business Executive, Clinton Scriven, for the vote of thanks. Uh, thank you, Dion. Good afternoon to all our industry colleagues, both locally and abroad. Firstly, a special thank you to our guest speaker, Mr. Thomas Milke. Your presentation was most insightful. A huge thank you to all of you, the attendees. We appreciate that you took time out of your busy schedule to join us today. We trust that you've extracted value for the time invested. Thank you to those that have participated and posed questions to the panel. We trust that the answers were to your satisfaction. We'd also like to extend our gratitude to our group CEO, Mr. Zubair Musa, and our group, our group Chief Commercial Officer, Mr. Shoaib Musa, for affording us this platform today. Thank you to our internal support team, members from our marketing, sales, IT, and commercial departments. These team members were integral in making this afternoon session possible. We also thank Mr. Ahmed Mehta for coordinating the Q&A session today. Last but not least, we thank Mr. Dion Kelthorpe, our managing executive, for ably performing the duty of host today. Thank you to all of you again. We look forward to hosting you in the near future in another one of our Willerton Group initiatives. Thank you, Dion. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. A good evening to all of you. We trust you've walked away more empowered from this webinar. We look forward to hosting you on the next one in the near future, God willing. We'd like to remind you that a YouTube link will be emailed to all um, the attendees who took the time to register for this webinar. Uh, Mr. Thomas Milker will be appearing on E! News um, within the next day or two and we will email you those details as well. Thank you for joining us and a good evening.